Well, the peace of Christ be with you. Why do we even say that? I don't know when that practice began, that ritual, that liturgy. It's been with the church a long, long time. The peace of Christ be with you, and the response is, and also with you. We're trained to say that. We do it quite well. But why do we say that? Especially in light of the scripture this morning that quotes Jesus. This difficult scripture that seems so out of place. It seems so unlike Jesus. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now you're familiar with hyperbole. Hyperbole is an exaggerated statement. It was very familiar in Semitic literature and language. Jesus was a master at using hyperbole. As you go through the Gospels and you find the teaching and the sayings of Jesus, you'll often find Jesus saying so many things that are just outrageous that are not to be taken literally, but are to be taken seriously. So Jesus wasn't saying literally, I have come to bring a sword. So what was Jesus saying? He was stating a fact. The reality is we live in a contentious world. And often being a follower of Jesus Christ Seeking to follow the the ways of Jesus puts us right in the middle of conflict rather than in the middle of peace. Now while we have a problem with Jesus saying, I did not come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword, how did the audience, the congregation, the church, that received Matthew's gospel hear those words. Now when we hear Jesus say, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, we scratch our heads and say, that doesn't sound like Jesus. It's contradictory to what Jesus said, isn't it? There are so many times that Jesus spoke peace. In the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. In what is referred to as the last discourse or teaching of Jesus before his crucifixion, the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to go away and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come back. You're not going to be alone. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit will be with you. And Jesus said to his disciples, My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but my peace I give to you. And then after the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection, we find that Jesus appears to his disciples. He comes into that room where they have gathered, confused and afraid, and the door is shut. And Jesus says, peace be with you. So Jesus is always offering peace, but not this time. I did not come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. So it's perplexing to us. But Matthew's gospel was not the, is not the oldest gospel. It was written about 50 years after Jesus was crucified. It was written to a generation and to a church that never saw Jesus face to face, that never heard Jesus teach and preach, never saw his miracles. It's believed by most Bible scholars that Matthew's gospel borrowed heavily from Mark's gospel and even from Luke's. It contains about 90% of what you find in Mark's gospel only it expands it. 
Matthew's gospel was written primarily to a Jewish church, perhaps a very urban church in a metropolitan area where the culture was very diverse, heavily influenced by the Gentile population. Perhaps the setting, the location, was Antioch of Syria. And so here were these Jewish Christians who had grown up in the Jewish tradition trying to figure out how to be a good Jew and also be a good Christian. There's the dilemma. They lived in a culture that didn't make it easy. Already some of their Jewish friends had ostracized them, turned away from them. Many of these Jewish Christians had already left the synagogue or had been kicked out of it. They couldn't figure out how to be a Jewish Christian, how to accept Gentile Christians. Which traditions do we keep and which do we discard? It was all very confusing. There was a lot of conflict between friends and neighbors and co-workers and even in the same family. So naturally, Jesus said to them, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. So you find in Matthew's gospel this collection of sayings and teachings of Jesus that were brought together in one gospel for this Jewish church that is struggling with all this conflict 50 years after Jesus. And I'm sure when these words were read and they heard them, instead of scratching their heads and having perplexed looks on their faces, they were nodding and going, yeah, right. That's the way it is. Amen. You know, people used to say amen in church years ago. They, that's what they did, you know. That's right. And when they heard Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword, they were going, yeah, tell it like it is. That's right. When I was a ministerial student years ago, I got the opportunity to preach at a black church in South Chicago. What an experience. And I said then, if, if, if I ever believe in reincarnation, I want to come back as a black preacher. I tell you, they, they have a lot more fun than we do. And the church was so responsive. And you don't just hear people... Uh, uh, saying amen, you heard him saying, yeah, pull over and park there for a while, preacher. Yeah. Tell it like it is. Strap it on. Yeah, it's great. So I'm sure when, when these words were spoken, they were going, amen, that's right. That's where we live. Right in the midst of the sword, the conflict. Now, I'm thankful that you and I really don't know firsthand a lot of persecution, if any. How many of us have ever in our Christian lives experienced persecution because of being a follower of Christ? Not often. But let's not forget that there are Christians in the world in many places that are persecuted. Seriously. There are places in this world where to be a Christian is to experience danger. You're in the middle of harm's way, and your life can be threatened, and you can be imprisoned. It's real. Truth be told, often some of the conflicts that we experience are not a, a result of our position as Christians as much as it is our disposition. Christians can be contentious people. True, we can be. Sometimes we just pick a fight. 
We just love conflict. Love to stir things up. And then try to convince ourselves and others that we're martyrs for the faith. It's because I'm a Christian. Well, maybe it's just because you're mean. Maybe it's just because you're difficult to be around. Did you ever think of that? Our own Betty Brown has written a book on that subject, you know, how to deal with difficult people and screwed up people. You know, it, it's, it, we live in a world that's so contentious. It's so hard to be around certain people. Now, don't look at anybody right now, you know. You know who I'm talking about. There are people that are just difficult to be around, difficult to work with, difficult to live with, difficult to be in church with. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about how following him, trying to live the Christian life, sometimes causes there to be conflict and division among people. They saw it firsthand. You know, come to think of it, Christianity, the cross, is and always has been counter-cultural. We better not forget that. Counter-cultural. We are called to be different, to think different, to act different to have different values, to treat people differently than the culture in which we live. The cross is what Jesus told us to take up. If anyone comes after me, Jesus said, I want you to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Well, truth be told, how many of us bear a cross for the sake of Christ? Where is our self-denial? Where is your cross? Now, truth be told, there have been some examples throughout church history, many examples of men and women of faith who were right in the middle of conflict because of following Jesus Christ. And some, even within our lifetimes, I was thinking of Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Now, there was a ten talented man. There was nothing he couldn't do. He was a musician. He was a writer, a philosopher. He was a medical doctor. He was a missionary. He could do it all. But when he turned his interest toward his true calling of being a doctor to indigenous people in Africa, trying to minister to them and save their lives and also tell them about the love of God in Jesus Christ. Do you know he put him right in the middle of conflict with family and friends? They said, Albert, you're wasting your life. You're throwing your life away. Now there's the sword, right? There's the sword. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German Lutheran pastor who fled Germany during Hitler's Third Reich, and he came to America to safety, studied at Union Seminary. And people said, you chose well. You're right here among your fellow Christians and freedom to write and preach and teach and study. It was very tempting to stay here. But this call to his heart said, go home to the conflict, the trouble, the persecution in Germany and take a stand there. And so he did. With family and friends saying, you're making a terrible mistake. How could you go to Germany at a time like this? But he did. And he went there to help the under, underground church. Do you know what happened to Dietrich Bonhoeffer? They hanged him. 
They hanged him. Mother Teresa. She worked with the poorest of the poor in India. Filth and poverty. Disease. Some said she's wasting her life. What about you? Has being a follower of Jesus Christ put you in conflict with co-workers, family members, classmates, church members, people in your community? What does it cost you to be a Christian? Really? You know, sometimes you run across something that is written so well, you just can't improve on it. And I ran across a great quote from Will Willimon. I quote him all the time because he's just so quotable. And Bishop Willimon wrote these words about our calling to follow Christ and what it means and how it's so countercultural. You know, we live in a world that is so contentious that excludes people, that thrives on hate and seeks to divide people. Well, Bishop Willimon wrote this, that to follow Christ is to be forgiving, to be inclusive, to be willing to touch the filthy, unholy mess of humanity in order to share God's love. Here's what it means. To sink one's hands into the filth of poverty, into the open wounds of disease, into the white leprous folds of putrefying skin, to sit beside the smug, rank, slovenly sinner and share a meal with him to ask him to pass the bread and then eat it when it comes to you from his greasy, greedy hand. Or to smile at a harlot and offer her the possibility of dignity. To look at her and see not her painted face and painted past, but her promising future. Jesus called for change. And when his followers lived a new kind of life, they got a lot of trouble for their efforts. What about you? What does it cost you to be a follower of Christ? I don't think we'll ever see a, a worship service in which we all stand and say, the, the non-peace of Christ be with you. Because perhaps the greatest threat to American Christianity is accommodation. We just all want to get along and fit in, you know? Don't rock the boat. And if our world sees it black and white, then who am I to see it as gray? If our world excludes certain people, then hey, who am I to preach and believe and practice inclusion? Who am I to love, to forgive? to sacrifice, to serve. I'll tell you who you are. A Christian. And that means self-denial. And that means taking up a cross. And that means following Jesus. And sometimes it's not pleasant. And sometimes it just hurts. But it leads to life. The cross always leads to death. But you can't have resurrection without death. If you ever want to know the life of Christ, the satisfying, fulfilling life 
that Jesus came to offer us, then first there has to be a death of what we want. A death of our agendas. Early in life, I memorized a scripture that stayed with me for a long time. It may be familiar to some of you. It's found in Romans 12. I memorized it in that old English language that's easier for me to memorize. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Be transformed into who God has called you and claimed you to be. Paul Shearer was a very respected theologian and teacher at Union Seminary many years ago. His son, his young son, had an accident playing one day and he had a jagged piece of steel pierced through his arm. They rushed the child to the emergency room and there the doctor said, we're going to have to pull that piece of steel out of his arm. And we can't put him under anesthesia because of his age and the risk involved. We're going to have to hold him down and literally pull that piece of steel out. Dr. Shearer said it was the most difficult thing he had ever done. It was put the weight and the strength of himself into holding his son down and watching the look in his son's eyes as he looked to his father and said, Why are you doing this? You're hurting me. To see the tears and hear the screams and the cries of his own son while the doctor pulled that piece of steel out. Because his son didn't understand that at that very moment his life was in the balance. That all of that hurt and that pain would lead to health and life. And that's what I think Jesus is telling us. When you take up the cross... There's nothing pleasant and easy and comfortable about that. But where it leads is life, life eternal. Let us pray together. O oh, gracious Christ, help us to understand what it means to be Christian. Free us from our desire for ease, our desire for popularity, our desire for comfort. Show us the way of the cross, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to be willing to courageously Take up your cross, that it may become ours. Amen.